I bet at least one or two of you is old enough to remember a television show by the name of Family Matters from the 90s. It was about a lovely black family in Chicago and uh, one of the most famous characters from that show was Steve Urkel, their quirky neighbor, you know, Mr. Nerd Central. You guys have probably heard of Steve Urkel. Raise your hands. You heard of Steve, Steve Urkel. All right, we good. Yep. Okay, Family Matters. So in that show, what I remember is the family, will, you know, and that's what the show's about, stuff dealing with the family. It's a good show. But they'll be, they'll be doing their thing in their household, and Steve Urkel will just bust in there random times, whatever, and interrupt what they're doing with his shenanigans, and not very edifying shenanigans. But Paul's going to do something like that today, though. Paul wants to talk about the family and the household, and he's just going to He's going to let himself in as an apostle of Christ into our homes and into our workplaces, and he's going to have a look around, and he's going to, he's going to, he's going to be raining on our party today, all right? The Apostle Paul. Uh, the Family Matters, the name of that show, is, has two meanings. It's a double entendre. Of course, it's dealing with the things of the family, so it's the matters of the family, and that's what Paul's dealing with here, but also it's saying that family matters or family is important, and we can say both about this text. As Paul deals with all these different general matters, Paul's not going to be micromanaging here, but he is going to speak to the general shape of things. When he does that, he's going to be emphasizing to us that how we live in our homes and how we live in our workplaces matters as Christians. It matters a lot. Spend most of our lives in those places. So let us heed what the Apostle Paul has to say to us about that. All right. Uh, there are, he, he addresses in these verses six groups of people. He addresses wives, husbands, children, fathers, bondservants, and masters. But those are presented to us in couplets. So husbands and wives and then children and fathers and parents, and then bond servants and masters. So that's how we'll take this in three parts. Wives and husbands, children and fathers, bond servants and masters. And then we'll end with some very encouraging notes that Paul gives us in this passage itself to encourage us in all these things. Okay, so let's begin. Wives and husbands. Uh, in verse 18, Paul deals with wives. In verse 19, he deals with husbands. Before we get into this, I wanted to give a little bit of background information on this. Um, when you go back to the very beginning of the Bible and our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, what happened is the curse entered into our world. And so everything in our world now changed after sin happened. Things now die, decay happens. This whole world is subjected to a level of chaos and uncertainty and death can come for any one of us at any time now because of sin. Anyway, when God walks Adam and Eve and the serpent through the curses, uh, he tells Eve that uh, something's going to happen between her and her husband because of sin. So Adam was created first as the head of the wife, and Eve was created as Adam's helper to come alongside him and follow him. And Adam was to care for Eve and love her like a tender shepherd, not ruling over Eve, but leading her as her loving leader. And Eve is to come alongside her husband and serve him in God's calling and serve him in the household and show him the honor and respect as the head of the household. This was God's original design. And in the garden, that quickly went right down the drain. <laughs> you know, the serpent, when he attacked, he attacked Eve, not Adam. He, 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 uh, he usurped the authority structure God had given there instead of stepping to Adam. So he went to Eve, and Adam didn't do his job, step in there and protect his wife. So Eve was deceived, and then Adam just went along with it. When that happened... Terrible things happen. I mean, amazing things happen because the first thing God did was promise the gospel. He said that one day a child or son of Eve would come and save 
people from what had just happened. He would undo the works of the serpent. But when he turns to Eve, he tells her that her relationship with her husband now was going to be thrown into chaos. He says to her there that your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. This was a pronouncement of a curse. It was an undoing of the natural order of the way that God made Adam and Eve. So the whole thing is thrown into chaos because of sin. It's two parts there. He talks about how Eve will see her husband and how Adam will see his wife. With Eve, he says, your desire will be for your husband. What does that mean? That sounds like a good thing, you know. That's what every man wishes, you know. He meets the love of his life, and that's all he wants, that she'll desire him. Well, that's not what it means. Uh, if you, you guys are familiar with what happens next after Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden and they have their children, that their, their, their sons, uh, that Abel is killed by Cain, that the, 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 their sons, one kills the other. And God knew that Cain was going to kill Abel, and God spoke to Cain and said that sin was crouching at his door and its desire was to master him, but he must rule over it. Sin desired to take over Cain's life, just like sin desires to take over our lives. Well, interestingly, it is the exact same Hebrew expression your, that sin desires to master you and that your desire shall be for your husband, to master him. So, with the fall comes this desire in the woman to control her man to master him and to rule over him and to control the things he does and the things he thinks and the things he says and the things he's into. That came because of sin. And no matter how godly and advanced you are in holiness, women and wives, that tendency is still within you. And that comes from the fall and it comes from the curse, that the desire to control. And then what he says about the man is that he shall rule over you that was not the, the original design. <laughs> that because of the fall now, men, instead of leading gently, instead of denying yourself to lead your wife and doing everything that you can to serve her and to, to treasure her, instead, now we have within us the desire to rule over our wives. And as Paul's going to say here, to be harsh with them. So this tragedy happened to the family in the fall and when Paul speaks to this through the gospel now, he speaks directly to these two things in these verses here. With the wives, he addresses them in the redemption of the gospel to cast off that sinful self, to put off that old self that wishes to control the husband. And then he turns to husbands and tells them to put off that old self that wishes to be harsh with your wife. Not to love and treasure her, but to rule over her and domineer her and tell her what to do and be a jerk. And we have this within us. So, but the gospel comes and it sweetly begins, slowly but surely, to change these things. Okay, just a bit of background there. Let's get to our verses now. Okay, so wives, you're up first. Sorry, ladies. Try to pull no punches here. The Apostle Paul certainly does not. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now the word submit here is pretty interesting. Um, in the Greek, it means submit. <laughs> now in a couple of verses, Paul's going to tell children to obey their parents. He's going to tell bond servants or employees we're going to get into to obey their masters and bosses. This is not the word for obey is the word for submission. And the idea that Paul's putting here is submit yourself to your husbands, is what he's saying. So he's encouraging the women to take on this mentality, this mindset of putting yourself under the submission of your husband. It's not so much about specific things. And it's not about obedience as such here but it is about the whole vibe of seeing your husband as the man that God has given you to lead you and to take care of you. 
to be that Prince Charming <laughs> that none of us can really be. Your sinful husband, warts and all, you are called to submit to and follow him, to be his helper. These are all very plain Bible words that Paul and Moses use about these things. Um, he gives, what does it mean to submit to your husbands here? Well, it's really something that is fitting. Notice what he says. As is fitting in the Lord. That means that it's just right. It's right. It's in the proper place. It connects like a puzzle piece exactly how it's supposed to. It's right in the Lord. It's fitting. What does this mean? Well, the Lord here is Jesus. In the New Testament, most of the time, the Lord, we're talking about Jesus here. Christ, it's fitting in Christ. That means that, yes, the original design was man and woman in this way, head, husband, over his wife, helper, and the loving reciprocal relationship there has fallen apart. <laughs> and all your unbelieving friends who are in marriages, they're dealing with these things to one degree or another, y'all, with these basic categories here of the fall. But the encouragement is coming to Christians. Paul is speaking here to Christian households. He's speaking to Christian families. This was a letter to the church in Colossia. So this is addressed to Christian wives. Now, this applies if your husband is not a Christian. That's true. It does apply. But it especially applies when your husband is a believer. An imperfect, sinful, idiot believer, like we all are, but a believer. One who does submit himself to the rule of Christ. And if your husband is that, even with all his warts, you can safely submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord because it's fitting. Women, in your marriages, you have this lovely part to play that pictures the church. It pictures the church. The way that we are towards God. That we receive God's love for us and then we give it back to Him. That's what we do. And there's that relationship with husbands and wives as well. Submit to your husbands. Have the mentality. Would you say, ladies, that you submit to your husbands? For that is what you are called to do in Christ. Uh, one other verse on this that can be helpful. Peter speaks to this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He's kind of more forthright than Paul is. He says, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. So he's speaking about the beauty of a woman. To be a woman is a beautiful thing. And every woman is lovely in God. And every woman has that desire to be beautiful and to be beheld as beautiful. And that is a good thing, you know. That's the way God has made it. And Paul and Peter encouraging women, it's really the Lord encouraging you women, that the very most beautiful thing you can do, yes, beautify yourself outwardly, that's all good, but the truest beauty you can do is have that gentle and quiet spirit with your husband. It's precious in the sight of God, and it's lovely. It's beautiful. This thing today, this aspect of God's design is under massive attack today. It is. This is seen, this bad language we're using here. Submit to your husbands. That's a no-no. The, you know, the world sees that as absolute bondage and suffering for women. Now, Paul, we'll see when Paul speaks to husbands that he speaks radically against the culture back in their day. But in our day, it is our job to speak radically against our culture regarding this verse and the way that Paul speaks about women submitting to their husbands. People hear submission, it's a bad word. But the reason that is, is probably because they've never seen it done well. They've never seen it done well. They have the wrong data set. They've only seen 
the, the kind of thing that Genesis 3 brings about. They see husbands harshly ruling over their wives and women just giving in to that, and they see that for what it is, wrong and evil. But they've never seen a godly woman whose delight it is to submit herself to her husband and serve him and do it unto the Lord, to respect and honor him as her head and as her leader. So ladies, before you get married, you've got to really think through that. Is this the guy that I want to follow? Is this the guy that I want to lead me? He will be leading me by and by. Uh, Peter goes on here before I hasten to move on. Don't worry, the men are going to get theirs too, all right? Uh, Peter here says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord. Now that's some pretty heavy stuff right there, y'all. Calling him Lord. Now I'm not saying you've got to go that far. I will say this, however. Uh, every couple has their nicknames for each other. My beautiful beloved wife in the back there, Angel. Our nickname for each other is Love. We call each other Love. But there's been occasion where she's called out to me and she accidentally, instead of saying Love, she said Lord. And I just, I reminded her how biblical that was from these verses. <laughs> Ladies, it is up to you as Christian women to be absolutely countercultural in this. It is. You know this is the good path. And if you set your mind and determine yourself to honor your husbands in this way, God will bless it. He will and you will find happiness and freedom because that's what God is all about and it's His design. Okay, husbands, your turn. He turns quickly to husbands and says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Again, he's flipping, on, he's flipping the fall on its head. The Gospel has come and has redeemed and now things are changing. God is renewing His creation back to its original design through the Gospel in our hearts. So husbands, you got it too. This means that you, Christian men, you struggle with loving your wives. You do. I do. We struggle with this because of sin that remains within our hearts. It is not in our natural state to love our wives. What does he mean by love? Well, again, in the Greek, it's very illuminating because it means to love. <laughs> to love. To treasure. To be tender with your wife. To fawn over her. You should have googly eyes over your woman. That is one of the godliest things that a man can exhibit is to love and care for and gently give attention to and nurture his wife, encourage her, bear her burdens. This is difficult work for men, and it's what we're called to do. Men, would you say that you love your wives? Of course, you love them. You love each other. But to love your wives in this way is an action. It's what you do. It's Again, it's a vibe. Does your wife... Feel that you love her, that you care for her, that she can get through to you. That's what Paul's calling us to be. And he says, do not be harsh with them. Now that's a great warning for us husbands. That means we struggle with this. It's within our hearts to be harsh. Even the gentlest and quietest among us, we will go there naturally. We will become easily frustrated with our wives. And that is the fall, and that is the curse at work within us. And may God kill it. Because we're going to do that if we're not careful. And if we're not intentional, we will do that. We have done that. We will do that. Even if your wife does not submit to you, even if that's not the vibe, even if you have not done what you can to set the tone in your marriage to lead well and win your wife's trust in those things, it doesn't matter. You still do this. You still love your wife. You still treasure her. You're still gentle and kind to her. And you do not be harsh with her. Peter, again, has something that helps us with this. When he turns to husbands in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, 
Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. In an understanding way. This means that when we're harsh with our wives or when we're frustrated with them, it, that comes from a place of we're not hearing them. We're not understanding their perspective. And Peter does say there, as the weaker vessel, to honor her as the weaker vessel. Now women are strong. Mothers are strong. Of course. But what does Paul mean by the weaker vessel there? Women are more delicate than men in the most beauteous way. Women are like delicate like a flower is delicate. The delicacy of a flower is something that gives it its beauty. You women are strong. You're strong in Christ. You're strong in life. You're strong in the workplace even. You're strong at home. with your. You are that. But in that, all that is to remember for husbands that your wife is something to be handled with care and gentleness. Do not be harsh with them. What does that mean for husbands? I mean, it means don't make promises that you can't keep don't be neglecting your wife and letting her down on a regular basis. Don't be doing that stuff because you'll cause her to become bitter towards you. Cannot do that. May the Lord help us. Both husbands and wives, we probably have work to do here in repenting to each other. Again, this is the standard that Paul calls us to in the Gospel, and it matters greatly. But there's encouragement here. Husbands and wives in Christ there's a new principle at work. There's a new power at work in both of your hearts. The new creation power of the gospel. You love each other and you grow in your love for one another. And as you repent of these things and seek to do them better, you can help each other. Forgive each other as you seek repentance and, and mercy from each other. Do it and encourage one another on. May the Lord bless that. Okay, I've got to keep moving. Next, children, you're up. Kids, you listening? All the children. I see that we're missing a few kids. KD's not here. I'm just really hoping to let him have it here. Children, this is not hard to understand. Children, obey your parents in everything. In everything. Now, obey here, again, so insightful, the Greek means to obey. It means to follow instructions. To follow instructions. That's what Paul tells children to do. That is your job, children. Now, you kids have probably heard of the Ten Commandments. Very important rules from God. He gives ten of them. The first four teach us how to worship God. And the, the last six teach us how to live with other people. And the very first one of that second list is... Children, honor your father and mother. It is a foundational piece. It's your, listen kids, your number one job. Number one job. You guys are going to school. That's part of what you do as children, all that. But the number one overarching job you have is to obey your parents and follow their instructions. Now, if you're here today, that means that your parents are Christians. So you lucked out. God is not calling children to obey evil parents if they tell them to do evil things. But you here today have been blessed because you don't have unbelieving parents. You have Christian parents. They're not perfect. None of us are perfect as parents. But... We do love God and seek to teach you about Him. So it means to follow instructions. I'm going to have the kids say that after me. Ready? Can you say follow instructions? All right. That's what it means to obey. So that means two things. The first thing that means is when mommy and daddy are talking to you, you are all ears. Listening. The Lord gave you one mouth and two ears. That's for a reason. That you listen first. When mommy and daddy are talking to you at all, when you hear the sound of their lovely voices, you stop and you listen to what they have to say. 
because you can't follow instructions if you don't know what they are. So you must listen to your parents and just obey them. They're not asking you to do anything crazy. I'm sure of it. When they ask you to do this or that, or come here or go there, just obey them and you will find the blessing. It's okay. (laughs) God has called this. But listen to this next part, children. Look at Paul. Paul's not going to leave you discouraged. Look what Paul says. Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord. Paul's not telling kids, you better get it together or else God is going to be angry with you. That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul's encouraging the children to listen to their parents because God loves that. It makes Jesus happy when you listen to your parents and you follow their instructions. It's so very important, isn't it? You should be encouraged in this. God loves that. Okay, let me move on. <laughs> Next, Paul addresses fathers. Now, this, can, this is both parents by extension. The word here can't even mean both. But fathers, you are the leaders in this. You are the leaders in this. I mean, again, we have these couplets here. Husbands and wives go together. Children and fathers go together. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Okay, what does that mean? Well, first of all, fathers, men, in your households, you are tasked by God to be the chief shepherds of your children. God has called us men in our homes. In in, in Ephesians, which talks about the same stuff, In a lot of the same ways, Paul says, bring up your children in the fear and discipline of the Lord, or the instruction and admonition of the Lord. And that tells us that it's our job, yo, as husbands, as fathers, to teach our children about God, to instruct them in the ways of God. That's our job. That's our job first and foremost. It's one of the most beautiful jobs that God gives to a human being is to parents and men to lead this, teaching our children about God and helping them to learn to live as adults. That's the whole goal. God gives us children. They're very small. They quickly become very large. And the next thing you know, they're grown up and they're out in the world on their own. Well, in that short time that we have with them, It is our duty to prepare them to face the world. And we don't have much time to do that. And so we got to get busy with that. We have to teach them about God and about His ways. Teach them about their Maker and what He's like. Teach them about what He's called them to be. Why He's made them and the glory of being made in the image of God. What a beautiful thing that is. Teach your children about that. Teach them about sin and the judgment that comes from it. And teach them about safety in Christ. That Jesus saves us from the judgment. And that Jesus loves the children. They say that Wu-Tang is for the children. That may be debatable. But Jesus is for the children for sure. And we must discipline them also. It is up to us to discipline our children. There's different techniques. I'm with that. It's all good. But there must be discipline in our homes. And we're called to bring that order. It's important that our children listen to us. They must get this idea of authority. That's our job, to give them this idea and concept of authority because that teaches them about this world and it teaches them about God. Okay, but as we do that... Paul warns us here that we do not provoke our children. What does that mean? Well, in Ephesians, he says, do not provoke your children to anger. So he's speaking about raising our children in the kind of way that easily 
upsets them, makes them angry, makes them bitter. He's talking about being heavy-handed. Do not be heavy-handed with your children. That's easy to do, but you cannot do it, for it says in the Bible not to provoke your children. There's this balance that we have to strike as parents with our kids of being firm and effective, but also patient and gentle and tender. And only the Holy Spirit can help us do that. Only by relying on Christ day in and day out can we begin to reflect that to our children. This also means be consistent with your children. So, if you have rules in the house, which I'm sure you do, and children, you know the rules in your home. Husbands, I mean fathers and moms, be consistent with those rules. Don't just enforce them one day if you're feeling like it, and another day you just want to give them a break so you don't enforce them. That's confusing to children. It can be very confusing. If one day they get in trouble for something and the next day they don't, that's easy to do. But we have to work hard to be consistent because if we're inconsistent and they get disciplined one day, when yesterday they did it and it was fine, and now we're coming with the wrath and fury the next day, they're going to be confused and upset. So we have to be consistent. We have to be gentle. A wise man once told me, always with your children. Always. If you have to err, err on the side of grace with your kids. Always. I have spoken harshly to my children. I've been inconsistent with my children. I've had to apologize to them over that. I continue to struggle with that in so many ways. But yet, this is what God calls us to be. Lest they become discouraged, it says. So, look, man. Don't be hard on the kids to the point where they don't, they don't even want to obey anymore. They're just so discouraged about it. Just like the Lord here says that He's pleased when children obey, it's our job to reflect that to them. When our children obey us, let us offer some praise and encouragement to them. Really. If the Lord is pleased when they obey, then we ought to be pleased as well. Visibly pleased and encouraging and rooting them on. Again, fathers, you're setting the tone in this. But moms, you're involved in this as well. This is for both. And you know the classic deal, wait till dad gets home. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's every, every household has that. Children are going to be pushy with their mom in ways that they're probably not with their dad. And it is our job to teach our children that obeying mommy is the same thing as obeying me. It's the same thing. Well, may the Lord help us with this also. This is the kind of work that's done slowly, little by little, over the years, beloved. Over the years, it's done. Got to keep moving. Okay. The last couplet is bondservants and masters in verse um, 22. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Okay, bond servants here, just a real nice way of saying slaves. That's what this was. In the Roman world, there was slavery, there was a lot of it, and a lot of slaves were getting saved back in the day. God was calling the humble, God was calling people who had nothing to the kingdom of his son, and people were becoming Christians who were owned by other people were slaves. And Paul encourages them to live within that life and to honor their earthly masters within that condition. That's what he encourages them to do. Now, Paul never affirms the institution of slavery as such. The institution was born to die. It still exists. In the modern world, we had a very nasty form of that here in our country that was much more dastardly than this in some very specific ways. We had that in, in this land that we live in, in the modern world. 
And in the modern world today, slavery still exists throughout the globe. It exists. But God does not approve of this institution. This, unlike husbands and wives and parents and children, this was not part of the original design for us. This is a result of sin, that one human being would own another and bring them into full subjection to do whatever they say. This is not the way. However, Paul is not inciting an insurrection here. Paul is encouraging these slaves who are in this condition to stay within it. What does that say about abolition? Again, the slavery we had in our country was a little more pointed. It was a kidnap-based system that was also based on ethnicity and skin color, very dastardly in every respect. And it was Christians that led the charge in abolition both in England and in the United States. Praise the Lord for that. It, it, when, even when Paul speaks to, in Philemon, you can see he's encouraging Philemon to set free his servant. And in 1 Corinthians 7, when Paul addresses slaves, he tells them, if you can obtain your freedom, do so. Okay, so Paul's not about it like that. However, he encourages the individual believer within that to seek God within that and serve within it. Think about Daniel in Babylon. Same thing. Same vibe. Daniel's supposed to serve there to seek the good. Joseph, Potiphar's house. Serve. Seek the good. That's what he's calling them to do. Now, we don't have this here. You know what I'm saying? We don't have bond servants. We don't have slaves here. So how can this apply to us? Well, preachers have usually applied this to the workplace, and I think that's very fitting. The principles here about bond servants and masters apply to us in our jobs. As we serve in the place of employment, we're not owned by our companies, even though sometimes it can feel that way, I'm sure. And yet we are to honor them in this exact same way. So in the workplace, this is what God calls. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Same word as used for children. Follow instructions at your job. Listen to what your superiors tell you and do it. Listen and do it to the best of your ability. Doesn't mean don't speak up. Doesn't mean don't offer feedback. Doesn't mean do something wrong if they tell you to do something evil. Doesn't mean don't stand up for yourself if you're being treated unfairly. Doesn't mean that. But it means as a general course, as a vibe, as a mentality, when you're at work, you're listening and you're accomplishing. You're listening and you're doing. That's the posture. He gives some, he gives some detail here. Not by way of eye service as people pleasers. This is, this is what it means. You know the classic. As soon as the boss walks in, you, get, you want to look busy. You know what I'm saying? You got to look busy when the boss is around, but otherwise you're chilling. When you do that, you're being a people pleaser. You're saying, yeah, it doesn't really matter what I do, but I want to make sure that the boss is happy. That's a bad way to do that. Not as people pleasers with eye service, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. So it has to come from here. When you do your work at work, which is difficult, which is long hours, which is grueling, which can be discouraging. When you're doing that work, you do it from here. You do that work for real. Do it honestly. Do it sincerely. Do it from the heart. If you do it like that, your boss will be pleased. You know what I'm saying? With God's blessing, it'll be another Daniel situation. You may be blessed within your company to do good to that company by advancing within it and doing your work most excellently as you can. God loves it. He loves it. And that's encouraging. Man, i got to keep moving. Uh, we're going to come back to verses 23 through 25 as encouragement. So, but let's just talk about masters real quick. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay. Uh, wish we had applied this one to the slave masters in America. wasn't quite done that way, interestingly. They forgot this verse. 
but this would apply here to bosses. If you're in a position where you're a boss at work, or you're a supervisor, or something to that nature, where you have employees under you you're, that, that report to you, this is direction for you. Treat those who are under your care and direction at work justly and fairly. Remember that. To always be just and fair. It's the same thing with our kids at home. That's what we want to be. We want to be fair. We want to be just. In the workplace, if there's people who report to you, treat them fairly. Do everything that you can so that they even feel that they're treated fairly. You do that, that's gospel witness right there that adorns the gospel. Knowing that you also have a master in heaven, never, ever let any position of authority that you have go to your head where you forget that there's a real boss upstairs. God is the Lord of all. None of us are in any real position of authority. And that applies to all the things we've seen in this passage. Let us never forget Okay, that's some heavy stuff, isn't it? It's uncomfortable. It's convicting. It's real. And we need to feel what Paul says here as he says it. He lays it on us, okay? But he doesn't leave us without some encouragement, and that's what we're going to end with here. Verses 23 through 25, he gives us some sweet encouragements. I'm going to call it the Spirit and the splendor of these things. The way that we approach these things. Okay, when Paul says what he says in these verses, he's talking to bond servants. So for y'all, this is instruction for the workplace. But this also applies to all the other things as well. To wives and husbands, to children and parents. It applies also. So hear it in that regard. Everything he just said. Ready? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do. This implies what you do at work, what you do at home, what you do at leisure, whatever. Whatever activity it is, work heartily. What does this mean? It literally could be translated work from the soul. Put some soul into it, you know? Put some care and craft and feeling into what you do. It's hard to do, but we're called to do it. How do we do this? As for the Lord and not for men. Remember Jesus? Paul's been telling us all about Him in this book. Christ this, Christ that. Christ everything, everywhere, ruling over all. Christ, our glory, our treasure. Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Christ, same thing here. Christ, do it for Him. Do whatever you do for Him. Do it for Jesus. If you do it for Jesus who loved you and died for your sins, you'll find it much easier to do. Wives, submit to your husbands but do it for Christ. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do that for Christ. Not just for them, for Christ. You have to do it for Christ. Children, obey your parents, not just because it's the right thing to do. Do it for Jesus who loves you. Do it for Him. Fathers and mothers, Raise your children, discipline them, be consistent with them. Take, our, take all the time that's needed to really instruct them and help them understand for the short time you have them. Do that for Jesus. <laughs> it's for Him. Bond servants at work, whatever your tasks are tomorrow, you get up, you go to work, whatever you got to do, remember to do it for Christ. And if you're overseeing those under you at work, lead them for Christ. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. Remember Willy Wonka? 
when Charlie Bucket successfully won what he thought was a lifetime supply of chocolate, which would be good enough, don't you say? But there was more. The chocolate was just the beginning. He had received the inheritance. He was receiving everything. He got the whole factory, the whole riches, the whole heritage. His whole family moved in. He was taken care of from that day forward forever. And the lifetime supply of chocolate. (laughs) When Paul says here, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. What inheritance is he talking about? Everything. Everything. That is what's coming to us in Christ. And as we serve Jesus in this life in these different ways, trusting Him, being forgiven by Him when we fall short, encouraging each other in these things, as we do it, we will receive the inheritance, beloved. Everything. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. Okay. So just to review, Paul calls wives to submit to your husbands. He calls husbands to love your wives. He calls children to obey your parents in everything. He calls fathers and mothers to not provoke your children, but to lead them gently that they not be discouraged. Bond servants and employees at work calls us to work heartily, to do what we do well, to do it for God and masters or bosses to lead well, justly, and fairly. Christ has purchased all of this. He died for our sins, and He died to give us the grace to grow in this. We, we grow in this, beloved. We become truly countercultural in every way. We become something different that the world has never seen. And may God bless it to us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would bless these words and that you'd help us to walk in these things. Convict us where we fall short and encourage us that we might move forward and try again. And when we fall, to get back up and try again. Bless our families. Bless our marriages. Bless our children. Bless our work. Bless our church. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.